the smoke, locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, even as the scorpions of the earth have power. Holy shit! <laughs> Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. I'm currently working on a number of videos at the moment, including a deep dive into the Attack on Titan series for next week. However, with all the requests I've had to cover more Stephen King content, I thought it might be fun for us to explore all of the creatures featured in the film adaptation of The Mist, as well as those that didn't end up making the cut. I also have a video covering the Grey Widowers, and one comparing the film adaptation by Frank Darabont to the novella by King, which I'll be leaving links to below. If you haven't seen them, I recommend you check them out first, especially the latter video, as it will provide some context as to what the creatures were and where they came from. But with that having been said, the creatures of the mists were essentially entities from an alternate reality that traveled to Earth via an interdimensional rift created by a military scientific endeavor called the Arrowhead Project. In the novella, the mist phenomenon first manifested in Brigton, Maine, and spread across an unknown portion of the US. Despite the somewhat open-ended conclusion of the novella, it's hinted that the mist and the creatures within it had spread across the entire country and would eventually envelop the world and wipe out most of humanity. But when it comes to the film, we learn that the military had begun exterminating the creatures and reclaiming much of the land they had taken. It appeared to be red, the angry colour of a cooked lobster. It had claws. It was making a low grunting sound, not much different from the sound we heard after Norton and his little band of flat earthers went out. I caught a nightmare glimpse of huge black lusterless eyes, the size of giant handfuls of sea grapes. And then the thing lurched back into the mist with what remained of Ollie Weeks in its grip. The Arachne Lobster, as a name would suggest, is a giant half lobster, half arachnid monstrosity, described in the novella as having a red, multi-segmented, scorpion-like body and lobster-like claws. In the film, the creature is roughly two stories tall, with fleshy, not entirely insectile skin. The base of its slouched torso stands on six arthropod-like legs, while the top side sports a pair of larger, pincer-tipped arms which it holds to its chest like an enormous mantis. Its head seems to consist of little more than a massive, vertebra-style maw lined with needle-like teeth, with the top of its cranium arching over the back. While we haven't had any confirmation from King, considering all of his stories inhabit a shared universe, it's likely that the Lobstrosity's Roland encounters in the Dark Tower the Drawing of Three were of the same ilk as the Arachne Lobster. It was maybe two feet long, segmented, the pinkish colour of burnt flesh that has healed over. Bulbous eyes peered in two different directions at once from the ends of short, limber stalks. It clung to the windows on fat sucker pads, and from its back there sprouted oversized, membranous wings, like the wings of a housefly. The scorpion flies were small, wasp-like creatures that were attracted to light and began swarming the store windows at night. Described in the novella as plump, segmented creatures with a stinger, the film alters their design slightly by removing these eye stalks and giving them hard, purple, segmented shells that resembled the halfway point between a wasp and a scorpion. Though not particularly threatening considering their size, these creatures possess a deadly neurotoxin that caused massive swelling and suffocation. The fog appeared to darken in exactly the way Ollie had described, only the dark smudge didn't fade away. It solidified into something with flapping, leathery wings, an albino white body, and reddish eyes. It looked a bit like the paintings of pterodactyls you may have seen in the dinosaur books, more like something out of a lunatic's nightmare. The pterobuzzards were nocturnal, pterodactyl-like creatures with four wings that were predators of the scorpion flies. In the novella, the buzzards were albino creatures described as nightmarish pterodactyls that sported long, membranous wings and a heavy hooked beak, while in the film, the pterobuzzards have more of a dark pinkish colour, pale eyes, double jointed legs and four light wings. Though the buzzards predominantly preyed on the scorpion flies, they managed to break into the store while in pursuit of their game and began altering their diet to include humans. A tentacle came over the far lip of the concrete loading platform and grabbed Norm around the calf. It was slate grey on top, shading to a fleshy pink underneath, and there were rows of suckers on the underside. They were moving and writhing like hundreds of small, puckering mouths. Legitimate nightmare fuel, and the source of much contention among fans, the tentacles from Planet X, as nicknamed by Norton's group, describe the limbs of an unseen creature in the mist that mercilessly drags Norm out of the storage room towards his doom. In the source material, the tentacles have fleshy pink flesh on their undersides and physically resemble the limbs of a large octopus, with mouths in place of suckers used to consume its prey. 
In addition to the horrific mouths, the tentacles featured in the film had claws lining its sides and a slit-like mouth near the tip. Unlike the other creatures that perished in the film, the tentacles were decomposed into a sizzling pool of black liquid within seconds after being separated from the atmospheric conditions of the mist it needed to survive. While we never see the creature's full body in the film adaptation, some fans believe that the tentacles from Planet X are those of the behemoth we see at the end. I personally don't think this is the case, as although the behemoth featured a few tentacles on its underside and above its head, they don't appear to be anywhere near long enough to grab things at ground level. A shadow loomed out of the mist, staining it dark. It was as tall as a cliff and coming right at us. It may have been the fact that the mist only allowed us to glimpse things briefly, but I think it's just as likely that there are certain things that your brain simply disallows. I don't know how big it actually was, but it passed directly over us. One of its grey wrinkled legs smashed down right beside my window, and Mrs. Repler said later she could not see the underside of its body, although she craned her neck up to look. She saw only two cyclopean legs going up and up into the mist like living towers until they were lost to sight. This leads us to the enormous behemoth, which was the final creature to be seen in the film. Also known as the impossibly tall creature, and standing at an approximate height of 300 feet, the behemoth was the largest creature to make its way through the interdimensional doorway. Seen from a distance, the behemoth was an enormous six-legged giant with a small head, tentacles around its neck and lower abdomen, and a weird mouth containing long, overlapping teeth. The creature was so large that it had its own ecosystem, with a number of smaller animals living on its body. Described as being larger than anything that ever lived on Earth, the behemoth never actually harms a living thing and doesn't appear to be hostile. Although never showing any hostility, likely due to its size and its inability to notice anything beneath it, its sheer immensity was a hazard in and of itself. Designed for the film, and even seen in the storyboard art for The Mist, the Terrapede was a large nocturnal insect that had huge claw-like antennae, with red tips denoting blood from its victims. Some of the early artwork for the film showed a Terrapede crawling into the store through a broken window, but Darabont ultimately decided on cutting the creature out of the film to save money on special effects. Featured in the novella, the killer kite was a giant kite-like creature glimpsed flying through the mist over David's scout. The creature featured three webbed green appendages tapering into tendrils, which made up its body, and gave it a resemblance to a giant crucifix-shaped living kite. And finally, we have the green fly, which was a large green dragonfly-like insect seen perched on David's car before flying over the mist. Described as having long, transparent wings and a shape resembling a deformed dragonfly, the green fly was cut from the film as the creative team felt it looked too similar to the scorpion flies. Unlike the entities It and He Who Walks Behind the Rose that harboured ill intent and were also from the same Tadash space, it's worthy of noting that the creatures of the mist weren't inherently evil. Though they end up wiping out a large number of Maine's population, they were simply animals trying to feed and survive in a strange new land. When the tentacle from Planet X reached in and grabbed the characters, it was simply an exploratory act, and if they happened to eat someone, it was like a shark attack with the creatures simply mistaking us for their typical food source. This was crucial to Darabont's vision for the film, with the director describing the beasts as creatures that were displaced, while the unhinged Mrs. Carmody was a true monster of the story. Watching the mist come across, mist is in, and crack! Well, that's all for today, folks. As I mentioned at the start, the next video will be exploring Attack on Titan, but I thought I might leave the video after that to a vote between Julius Avery's 2018 horror film Overlord and Duncan Jones's 2011 sci-fi thriller Source Code. I'll be posting a poll tomorrow in the community section of the channel, so be sure to place your votes. A huge thanks to everyone who requested we explore the creatures of the mist. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content, and if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Let's go! Get up! Get up! Get up! Get up! Come on! We gotta go! My ankle! Oh, Jesus! Molly! Molly!